Ho Jing was a general who served under the Northern Wei, Eastern Wei, and Liang dynasties. In 548 AD, he rebelled against Emperor Wu of Liang and usurped his throne. The emperor starved to death while in Ho Jing's custody, and during the rebellion, many important families in Jiangnan were wiped out. The population plummeted, and the once prosperous land became a graveyard. Jiangnan needed a hero to save its people and heritage from its desperate plight. This was when Chen Baxian made his appearance in Jiangnan. Though not from the upper classes, he led troops to help defeat Ho Jing. He defeated an invasion by Northern Qi, and he went on to found the Chen Empire, restoring peace and prosperity to Jiangnan. But 33 years later, the Chen Empire was in crisis. Like a portent of his empire's destiny, the last Chen Emperor. Chen Shubao recited a line from his own poem: "Jade trees and rear courtyard blossoms, they won't last long." This little town in Jiangnan. Used to be called Chengcheng. During the Northern and Southern Dynasties period, many Southern indigenous people lived here. Chen Baxian came from one such ethnic group. He was poor, but his name, meaning supreme ruler, implied great ambition. This is Chen Baxian. 他这里的打扮呢，是一些平民的打扮，因为陈大仙他没有出身豪门，呃，用现在的话讲呢，他就是出身一个贫寒的家庭啊。但是呢， the people of the town where Chen Baxian was born like to point out that he was from a humble background, but at the same time, they like to glorify him. Behind Chen's statue. A timber pavilion stands above a well. The locals call the well the Sacred Well. Yang Yijian, a researcher from Changxing County in Zhejiang Province, conducted an archaeological investigation beneath the well. This is not a mouth, not a nose, because it's his mouth, his mouth, his mouth. 这个井口离我们现在这个地面要一米左右，那么这个身上井下加上起来，这个是地面，那么下去还一米左右。这里有小瓦，中间上面是小瓦，下面下去有四块条石拼合起来的，这个是他真正的井口。在我们当地民间有很多美丽的传说，说他母亲啊、呃，在嗯、呃、去井里打水的时候，啊啊，突然就看见一条小白龙。呃，进入他的府中，然后他就怀孕了，啊，然后陈八仙后来出生了。出生之后呢，说井里这个水都沸腾了，然后家人把井里的水舀上来给他沐浴，然后就把他啊这口井称为圣井。This legendary hero was born into a poor farming family. In his youth, he also worked as a fisherman. He later became a low-ranking village official. In his spare time, he enjoyed practicing martial arts and reading books about history and war. But Chen Baxian had bigger ambitions than his village could ever satisfy. He decided to go somewhere with greater opportunities. In Jiankang, the capital city, he became the manager of an oil warehouse. Intelligent and hardworking, he was soon invited to join the staff of Xiao Ying. The Marquis of Xinyu, who belonged to the clan behind the Liang Dynasty, his political knowledge and diligence soon won him favor with Xiao Ying. When Xiao Ying became the governor of Guangzhou, he took Chen Baxian with him as an advisor. Chen Baxian was responsible for military recruitment, and eventually became the head of the local military. For Chen Baxian, then in his thirties. This was a life-changing period. 
However, if Chen Baxian wanted a political career, he would have to break through the invisible barrier that allowed certain families to dominate the political landscape. Although imperial politics had been restored, very few people of lower social status had won the emperor's trust. Influential families had complex connections with one another, and it was they who wielded real political power. People of lower social status were excluded. Yanjiro 基本上给毁灭. It was during the Hojing Rebellion that Chun Baxian's star first began to shine. Faced with a land in ruins, Chun led 3,000 troops north from Guangdong to fight for the emperor and suppress Hojing. As he went, he sent messengers back to Xiao Yi, who was to become Emperor Yuan of Liang. This legitimized his northern expedition. Chun's career began to take off. During the Ho Jing Rebellion, two powerful ministers dominated Liang Dynasty politics. Chun Baxian and Wang Sengbin from Taiyuan, who represented the scholar officials in the north. Their joint forces easily suppressed Ho Jing's rebels and recaptured Jian Kang. After the rebellion had been quelled, Xiao Yi declared himself emperor in Jiangling and later Emperor Yuan of Liang. During his reign, Emperor Yuan rewarded his subjects according to their achievements. Yet, even though Chen Baxian had been crucial in quelling the Ho Jing rebellion, it was Wang Sengbin who was appointed Supreme Commandant of Jian Kang. Chen Baxian was made Governor of Yangzhou, but was still excluded from the core of political power. Scholar officials and ordinary people are not to be mixed, the conventional wisdom ran. So it is understandable that the Emperor did not completely trust the commoner Chen Baxian. The challenges confronting the Liang Empire came not only from within the royal court, but also from beyond its borders. Northern Qi and Western Wei were two powerful rival empires in the north. During the Ho Jing Rebellion, they had occupied a large amount of Liang territory, including half of the Yangtze River. As a result, the Liang Empire was at great risk. When Xiao Yi declared himself Emperor Yuan of Liang, Jingzhou in Hubei province was called Jiangling. Jiangling was the site of an infamous book-burning incident 1,500 years ago. In 554, three years after the Ho Jing Rebellion, the Western Wei army laid siege to Jiangling and Emperor Yuan. Jingzhou Library has a collection of more than 400,000 books. 20,000 of them are ancient texts. Compared to many libraries, it is relatively small. Yet 1,500 years ago, it was the repository for most of China's books. It held more than 140,000 ancient volumes.
Today, many of those books no longer exist. Only a few ancient texts remain to give us an insight into the glories of the past. This 作为图书馆的管理这么一些好的东西 Believing that Zhang Ling was about to fall Emperor Yuan set fire to his library declaring from tonight Civil and military arts will no longer exist. In terms of quantity, only half of the ancient texts were lost. But in terms of quality, Emperor Yuan had destroyed the essence of a collection accumulated over many dynasties. When captured and asked why he had done it, he replied, After reading tens of thousands of books, I still ended up like this. So, I burned them. 这个焚书呢，当然是我们中国历史上图书的那么十几次重大的灾难当中最最要命的一次。为什么？我们以后可以说，基本上除清朝以外，啊，那都已经是积累了这么多，又积累了一千多年了，对吧？啊，再也没有
so they could be served with steamed rice and pieces of duck meat. This was the origin of the famous Nanjing dish, steamed rice with duck in lotus leaf. After they had enjoyed their meal, the troops' morale improved greatly, and they won a decisive victory over northern Qi, which retreated to the north side of the Yangtze River. Finally, Chunbasian had defeated a powerful enemy. Having driven out the Northern Qi army, Chun believed he had earned the right to the throne of the Liang dynasty. He had fought for his country and was ready to become emperor. In 557, at the age of 54, Chun Baxian had Xiao Fanzhe yield the throne to him, so establishing the Chun dynasty, with himself as Emperor Wu of Chun. From then on, people of lower social status began moving up in Chinese society. He had left his hometown at an early age as the son of a farmer. Thirty years on, Chun Baxian was emperor. As Emperor Wu of Chun, he never forgot his roots. He embraced honesty and equality as his governing principles. This reflected the political aspirations and circumstances of ordinary people, in stark contrast to the extravagant lives of the Southern Dynasty's elites. In 1994, Chun Baxian's descendants refurbished his residence in his hometown, Changxing. In keeping with his simple values, the memorial hall does not appear at all extravagant. As the founder of the Qin dynasty, Emperor Wu of Qin was resilient, diligent, and frugal. During his regime, he transformed the opulent style of the imperial palace, putting simplicity and moderation ahead of extravagance. He was self-disciplined and thrifty. The daily meals contained only a few dishes. In private banquets, the containers were made of clay and shell. There were always sufficient meat and vegetables, but never to the point of waste. As the economy recovered, he still insisted on not wearing luxurious clothes or jewelry in the palace, and not having chiming bells or slave dancers. The Qin dynasty promoted simplicity, helping the state recover from the ravages of war. Chun started his career as a village official and became a general. He ended up with the task of saving the state from a desperate situation. Finally, he declared himself emperor and restored the war-torn land of Jiangnan to peace and prosperity. He ensured that Chinese culture could continue to develop in the south of China for many years to come. If the Qin dynasty had been able to continue on this path, it may have gone from strength to strength. But the course of history is full of accidents. In June 559, after a reign of only 21 months, Emperor Wu of Qin suddenly died. the one un tomb in Nanjing. Some say this is where Emperor Wu of Chun was buried. Nanjing was the capital of six dynasties and has seen many historic events. The one un tomb does not draw many tourists, and even locals don't know it that well. Only two lonely statues stand guard. The Chun dynasty is long gone. Of all the southern dynasties, it had the least territory and power. Yet it was able to defend this prosperous and culturally significant district. 
It left a rich legacy for the subsequent Sui and Tang dynasties.这个高级西剧的西魏那当然是一个民族英雄豪强势力极大的削弱这个过程是有利于以后随代对于江南的统治Chen became emperor with plans for a new era involving great change but he died after only two years with his work unfinished since his only surviving son was serving as a hostage in northern Zhou he was succeeded by his nephew Chen Qian Emperor Wen of Chen Emperor Wen was one of the Southern Dynasty's few competent emperors. He was fully aware of the challenges confronting the Chun Empire. During his reign, he quelled rebellions in Xiangcheng, Linzhou, and Jiangnan. He also prevented Northern Zhou from advancing east along the Yangtze River. He consolidated the government and focused on agriculture and water conservation projects. Jian Lake in the city of Shaoxing is a famous tourist site in Zhejiang province. During the Qin dynasty, it was a renowned water conservation project. Under Emperor Wen, a 60-kilometer canal was built to irrigate the fields. The canal still exists today. Under Emperor Wen's fair and clearly defined policies, the economy developed and the state began to thrive. Because of its stability and prosperity, the Qin dynasty's relationship with the northern Zhou Empire improved. Emperor Wen sent his imperial secretary to the northern Zhou capital, Chang'an, to bring back his younger brother, Chen Shu, who became Emperor Xuan of Qin. After his years of confinement, Chen Shu understood the pain of losing your home and country. This gave him a sense of mission. So, after ascending the throne, he decided to reclaim Chen's lost territory. The southern dynasties had lost their long-held territory north of the Yangtze River to northern Qi. Chen had also lost Jing province and the Sichuan Basin to northern Zhou. The consequent loss of defense in depth was the Qin Empire's greatest weakness. In 573, 100,000 Chun troops crossed the Yangtze River to confront northern Qi. They quickly reclaimed their lost territory without facing much resistance at all. However, Emperor Xuan decided to go no further northward. He would stop while the situation was still in his favor. He reasoned that the Chun army was still not strong and that the campaign had already overtaxed a dynasty that was still getting back on its feet. As the saying goes, when shepherds quarrel, only the wolf wins. While Chun was warring with Northern Qi, Northern Zhou seized its opportunity. In 577, Northern Zhou conquered Northern Qi and unified North China. The unification of the North created a powerful enemy for Chen. Unwilling to allow this emerging power to expand further, Chen embarked on a second Northern campaign. But this time, Emperor Xuan faced a catastrophic defeat. In Shu province, the Chen army was almost completely wiped out. Xuan Di Bei Fa is the first 陈朝没有准确的估价当时南北的形势
，同时呢也怀有骄傲情绪。那当然了，这一次战争过程当中，也使得陈朝原来就不怎么样的国力遭到了一次重挫，啊，那恢复起来又很费手，是不是？所以这次北伐的失败，只能说南朝政治其实已经。Recognizing the urgency of the situation, Emperor Xuan had focused on bolstering the Qin Empire. In 582, he urged his subjects to work diligently together with a single mind, along with the civil and military officials. Soon afterwards, he died. Twenty-five years after the foundation of the Qin Empire, Qin Shu Bao ascended the throne. He is known as the final lord of Chen. Sunlight shines through flowers, their fragrance wafting on the breeze. Beauties, their top knots adorned with plum blossoms, amble back and forth. Chen Shubao's poem, Plum Blossoms Falling. As emperor, Chen Shubao's main duty was to govern his empire. But affairs of state didn't interest him. He preferred to write poetry, praising the beautiful scenery of Jiangnan. Chen Shubao had a miserable childhood. He was two when Jiang Ling fell to Western Wei, and he and his parents were taken prisoner. In 562, at the age of nine, he returned to Jiangnan and became the prince of An Chang. As a small child, Chen Shubao had suffered from war, but by early adulthood as the prince of An Chang, he enjoyed a life of great wealth. Unlike his father, Chen Shubao did not understand an emperor's responsibilities. As Wei Zhang of the Tang Dynasty said of him, born in an imperial palace, and growing up in the hands of women, he had no understanding of the hardships of common people raising crops. The Chun Empire faced internal problems as well as external challenges. When Chen Shubao first took the throne, he announced a number of imperial orders in an attempt to deal with these challenges. As he said at the time, one should never just live a life of comfort and forget about governing the country. If Chen Shubao had acted as he said and devoted himself to the state, the Chen Empire might have been saved to some extent. But he had no ambition, and he did nothing to address the situation. Just as the Qinhuai River flows through Jiankang, Talent flourishes among those who live along its shores. Chen Shubao loved literature and was a talented poet of a certain kind. Palace-style poetry focused on beautiful scenery and frivolous and extravagant love affairs. It too was frivolous, though also delicate and beautiful. As a prince, Chen Shubao gathered many scholar officials in the East Palace where they formed a large literature group. Certain members of this group often ignored the rules of etiquette and behaved disrespectfully. They were known as the Group of Ten. After Chen Shubao became emperor, the literature group grew even more powerful under his protection. Xu Ling was his favorite. He was called the master of literature, and after his death, the master of poetry. With Chen Shubao's taste in mind, Xu Ling compiled an anthology, New Songs from the Jade Terrace, with pieces suitable for ladies to recite. A literary milestone, it is the third anthology of Chinese poetry, after the ancient classic of poetry and the songs of Chu. This is the first time I've 他也说了，像孔雀东南飞这样的歌颂女性、反抗封建压迫、封建礼教的好的作品，但是他的审美趣味可以说是有些俗，甚至说是俗不可耐。宫体是关心的是什么？是女性的美貌、身体，还有
床子之患。我们可以用一句话讲，就是说，他的儿女勤多，风云气少。Chen Shubao completely neglected his responsibilities as emperor. He was so deeply engrossed in literature and socializing in the courtyard with his scholar officials that he paid no attention to state affairs. The government of Chen descended into chaos, while the emperor and his ministers indulged in Jiang Nan culture and dreamt of love affairs. From the north comes a ravishing maiden. Her beauty has no peer. One look at her, and cities fall. At the second glance, empires collapse. This poem could have described Chen Shubao's favorite concubine, Zhang Lihua. It is said she had shiny black hair that fell in long cascades. She was elegant, beautiful, and charming. With her radiant expression, she seemed like a goddess. Chen Shubao fell in love with Zhang Lihua when he was still crown prince. After the death of Emperor Xuan, Shubao's younger brother Xu Jian stabbed him in the neck in an attempt to usurp the throne. During Shubao's recovery, it was not his wife, but his consort Zhang Lihua, who was at his side and tended to his injuries. Zhang Lihua was the best loved of all his many concubines. Chen Shubao indulged his concubines by building three luxurious pavilions within his palace. From the time of the founding emperor, the decor of the inner court had always been simple, but Chen Shubao started to make changes. In the second year of his reign, he carried out large-scale construction to build three pavilions interconnected via a two-story corridor. He spared no expense, hiring the best craftsmen and using the most precious of materials. The pavilions were more than thirty meters high. The doors, windows, lintels, and railings were made of Indian sandalwood, and decorated with gold, jade, and pearls. The beds, curtains, and other treasures were unlike anything ever seen before. The breeze carried its exotic fragrances for miles. While the dawn light filtered through to the courtyard, to celebrate the completion of the three pavilions, Chen Shubao wrote the poem "Jade Trees and Rear Courtyard Blossoms." Beautiful eaves and spring forests face the tall palace. Women with new makeup and delicate beauty meet us, smiling. Their charming faces look like flowers holding their dew. Glistening light from the jade trees shines in the rear courtyard. While later generations praised the elegance of the poem, one line foretold the destiny of the Chen Empire. Jade trees and rear courtyard blossoms—they won't last long. Meanwhile, in the north, the Sui Dynasty had displaced Northern Zhou. And Emperor Wen of Sui was already planning to invade Jiangnan as well. In contrast, Chen Shubao displayed his ignorance of the political situation by failing to engage the right advisers. In 586, the 34-year-old Chen Shubao announced an imperial edict. He wanted to emulate Emperors Yao and Yu the Great and take advice from his ministers, just as they had. As the Sui troops continued to advance, Ren Zhong, the Chun general, wrote to the emperor to warn him that bribing of officials is becoming blatant. If a war breaks out on the borders, the Chun Empire will be destroyed. Chen Shubao's right-hand man was Kung Fan. As one of the group of ten, he'd been promoted to imperial secretary. He dismissed Ren Zhong's advice. With the rebuke that the empire was safeguarded by the impassable Yangtze River, he added that he was much more intelligent than any military official, whose courage counted for nothing. On hearing this, Chen Shubao immediately revoked Ren's authority. From then on, whenever any military official made a mistake, 
Chen Shubao would revoke his authority and reassign it to a civil official. Schemers such as She Wenqing, Shen Keqing, and Kung Fan were all appointed by Chen Shubao. Most of them were talented writers and poets. If they had just been a group of scholar officials drinking and writing poems, they might not have caused much damage. But many of these high-ranking intellectuals did nothing to govern the state or work on strategies to deal with border issues. Like Chen Shubao, they had no interest in planning for the state's future development. In the winter of 588, a huge Sui army crossed the Yangtze River to invade the southern dynasty. Even as it advanced, Chen Shubao was still drinking and reciting poetry, believing that the impassable Yangtze River barricaded him from his enemy. But Jiang Kung was not the haven it appeared to be. The Yangtze River could not prevent enemy troops from marching south. Feigning peace and prosperity could not change this reality or save the Chen state from destruction. Early in 589, the Chen dynasty lost the war without even fighting a battle. Chen Shubao's world was finally lost, along with the beautiful scenery of Jiangnan. In a corner of Jiming Temple in Nanjing, there is a well. Like the sacred well of Emperor Wu of Chun, it too has a name, Rouge Well. And it is actually more famous than the sacred well.苟且偷生,容易被后人诟病。都纷纷劝陈后主,干脆就是衣冠正坐,面对这个随军的进犯。This is not the actual well that Chen Shubao hid in, but that doesn't stop people from associating the well with the history and legend of Chen Shubao. The night Chen Shubao lost the battle, he also lost his dignity as an emperor, but he did not abandon his concubines. If it had been a romance, this life and death love story might have spread far and wide. But as an emperor, Chen Shubao lived an ignoble existence and brought shame to his dynasty. The drama did not end with him hiding in the well. Dangshi <laughs> 但实际上它不是腌制的痕迹,它是那个石脉,红色的石英岩,石脉,石脉造成的。When Emperor Wu of Chen was born, the water of the ancient well in Chengxing appeared to be boiling. After the Chen Empire was established, this well was named the Sacred Well. 33 years later, the Chen Empire came to an end when Chen Shu Bao humiliated himself by hiding in a well. That well was called the Rouge Well, but the people of Nanjing also call it the Well of Shame. Chen Houzhu, Chen Shubao, we can say is a love saint. From the literary sense, it is seen in Chinese history. Literature is a must. We cannot say he is a bad man. 
，但是真的是一个欢乐。程秀主去世的时候，隋朝给他的谥号“杨”，跟后来隋炀帝杨广那个“杨”一样。那“杨”是什么意思？就是欢待政务，一天到晚吃喝玩乐玩呢，这是个恶谥。Chen Shubao lost his empire and died at the age of 53, fully 16 years after the end of the Chen Dynasty. However, he never again saw his capital Jiankang, as the Sui troops razed it to the ground. Today, all that remains of the Southern Dynasty is some 300 square meters of ruins in Nanjing. 南京今天看不到多少成长的东西，但是这个看不到以后啊，反而一种叫虚景残情。这陈朝这个三十三年的历史啊，给我们留下来的东西很多。历史我们不一定就要像这个唐朝啊、汉朝啊、明朝、清朝那么长，对吧？有的短的历史，它在一个比较短的时间段里面，把很多的东西反映。陈朝在这一点上呢，应该说是中国历史上一个很典型的。